Fabian. The next gen Sony A7C is finally here. This has more megapixels, more custom buttons, the updated menu system, AI autofocus, 7 step in body image stabilization, 10 bit, 422, and 4K, up to 60 frames per second. Put an asterisk on that. Now, Sony is not launching just one, but two. Two new A7C cameras. One aptly named the A7C Mark II, and the other, which quite frankly caught me by surprise, the A7C Mark R. It's just R, A7C R. There's no Mark. Which this is almost the same as the Mark II, but with more resolution and more dollars, amongst many other little things. It's like having twins with two varying personalities. Now, the key phrase is almost the same because there are so many micro details that really separate these cameras apart that will honestly hurt your brain trying to process all of it. But don't worry, I'm here to break it all down so you will never have to choose wrong because you chose the Vong. Oh my God. All right, all right, all right, sit down, class. Professor Vong is here. Class is in session. These. These ain't books, babies. These are all the hard drives I have to get when I need to shoot with these damn high resolution cameras. Ugh. Now, in order to know what makes these two cameras different from each other, we need to understand what makes them the same first. The look and feel. My favorite thing about the A7C series cameras is how compact it is given its full frame nature. Both cameras are around 515 grams on their own. We're out on a casual stroll around LA today. Got the Sony 24mm f2.8G on the A7C2 and the new 16-35G Master Mark II on the A7C-R. Man, just look at the size difference. When you pair these cameras up with lightweight compact lenses, it's an absolute joy to use. Fortunately, there are a ton of high quality, small full frame lenses in the market today. But if you are a fan of bigger lenses with those bokehlicious apertures, then you're gonna feel that front drag. But that's what I love about mirrorless interchangeable lens cameras. There's a setup for everyone. The overall physical difference is very similar to the original A7C, but we now have a front dial, one additional custom button, which makes two on the camera now, an unmarked and reprogrammable exposure compensation dial, and a dedicated mode switcher to swap between S and Q, video, and photo. And all of this dramatically expanded the operability of the camera because there were complaints about the lack of customizations in the previous iteration. On top of that, we're getting Sony Menu 2.0 with full touch navigation and on-screen touch functions, which could be swiped away or disabled entirely if you wanted to. But I'm a huge advocate of combining the usage of both touch and analog buttons to maximize the shortcuts of the cameras. However, I do wish the Touch UI was customizable as well. Quite frankly, there are a few options that are defaulted here that I would never use. Instead of a redundant playback here on the screen, I want to be able to change it to activate grid display instead. Regardless, it's been incredibly nice that the entire screen is touch interactable, which has been making Sony cameras a lot more beginner friendly. If you've been following the last few camera launches, you already know Sony introduced a new feature in auto mode called My Image Style. It pretty much gives you sliders to control the blur, the exposure, and the colors, much like using the camera on your smartphone. You don't have to know camera jargon just to be able to get the look that you want, which has been a very, very welcome feature for casual and beginners. Now, in addition to screen reader, screen reader on. if you're also going blind, pixel peeping like I've been for so many years, then you'll also appreciate the enlarged screen feature. This magnifies a portion of the menu and you use touch to swipe around. Keep in mind, if you do have this enable, you will need to use the buttons on the camera to control the action, as touch will now be limited to just moving the menu screen around. The EVF resolution remains sort of unchanged, still 2.36 million dot, but it is brighter. However, the LCD resolution did get a bump. From 921,600 dot to 1,036,800 dot. While not the best that it can be, it's still decent enough to double check focus and get a more accurate color reading in sunny weather bright monitoring compared to the original A7C Mark I. 
The inputs and outputs are the same. The USB-C here is with power delivery charging, which also allows both cameras to act as a webcam, streaming up to 4K 30p, and it can pipe audio from the camera. And uh, if you're not a fan of micro HDMI, boy, do I have bad news for you, buddy. Now, if you're someone with big hands who's been complaining about the grip size of these smaller cameras, I'm talking about you, Michael, with your big ass hands, always complaining on the internet. Oh, Sony camera bodies are so small. My big old hands, where's my pinky gonna rest? Where? <clears throat> Sorry about that, Michael. Got a little carry away right there, okay? Anyways, Sony has designed a specialized grip extension which comes included with the A7CR. I really love this design because it gives you back a quarter inch screw hole and a latch system to access the battery door without having to remove the entire grip. Genius. Now I know what you're gonna ask and the answer is no. It does not work with other Sony bodies. It's not designed for them. Not even with the ZBE1, which I am slightly bummed about. So the grip extension here really helps out when you're using a bigger lenses. It does add a lot more comfort. When you're using smaller lenses, probably not necessary. Fortunately for me, I have small hands, so no grip extension needed. If you're eyeing this grip, but you're getting the A7C Mark II instead, then how much is this gonna run you as a separate accessory? 150 bucks? You're kidding me. AI autofocus. Besides the increase from 693 face detection autofocus points to a whopping 759 points, both the A7C Mark II and the A7CR are souped up with the latest AI autofocus technology in both photo and video. It has a variety of subject recognition. Humans, animals, birds, cars, trains, planes, and even bugs. We got bees. Got the bee? Bees. Oh, 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 no, 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 oh, no, 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 no. Why can't we just get like a nice butterfly? I don't choose the bugs, they choose me. <laughs> I hate bug autofocus. It's not worth it. I'm leaving. Well, I guess that's the end of BAF. We're at a Peacock Sanctuary right now. Got the Zeiss Bodice 85 f1.8. Nice lightweight combo right here. Also got the Xperia phone to record the screen so you guys can see the bird IAF in action. Let's see what we can get. Oh yeah. Now I wouldn't upgrade to these cameras simply for these new focus recognition alone. However, if you are already specializing in these, then you'll find a new subject recognition to be very helpful. But I mean, even if you don't, give it a try anyways. I never consider myself an animal photographer, but the amount of animal photos that I have taken dramatically increased just because these options were available. But there is no denying the quality of life improvements that the new AI autofocus brings. For example, it has the new AI post estimations for humans, animals, and birds, which does a great job at guessing where the eyes are even when your subject is turned 90 degrees or completely around. And if the eyes are not found, it will at least recognize the head and even the body. Now we don't have quite a long enough lens for this, but the great thing about having ample amount of megapixels in these cameras is that we can crop and reframe to get the composition that we want. Damn, just look at how majestic this peacock is. Photo resolution. Since we're talking about megapixels, the A7C Mark II is a 33 megapixel full frame sensor camera and it has a flexibility of shooting in APS-C Super 35 mode at 14 megapixels. Not bad. The A7CR on the other hand is a 61 megapixel full frame sensor camera that can come down to a generous 26 megapixels in APS-C Super 35 mode. Look at this photo taken from the A7CR. Seems like a whole lot of nothing, right? Bam! Hummingbird. Now that's what I love about high resolution cameras. You get to zoom in on your photos later to see what you've missed. But just how much better is it to have almost twice the resolution? Let's compare. At first glance, kind of hard to tell. But when you zoom in enhance, oh yeah, there you go. What does that say? America's Got Talent hosted by Terry Crews. Wow, I don't think I would have been able to know that if it wasn't for them 60 megapixels. Wow, look at all these megapixels. But in all seriousness, for most folks, 33 megapixels is plenty enough. 
don't pixel peep too hard or you're gonna have to use the enlarge screen feature sooner than you think. However, there is no denying the advantage of the R series. We're free to crop a lot as you've been seeing, and we have no fear to add APS-C lenses into our arsenal purely for the size and reach thanks to its generous 26 megapixels in Super 35 mode. But we also have flexible RAW sizes in form of lossless compressed RAW, so for when jobs we do don't demand all that 60 megapixels, we can size down. And exclusive to the A7C R, or rather exclusive to the latest R series cameras, we have pixel shift multi shooting, which creates an even higher resolution of your photo by doing up to 16 image composite, and it can detect and correct small pixel movements such as people and leaves. Perfect for landscape, cityscape, and architecture. On the flip side, because of the smaller resolution, the A7C Mark II has a few extra frames of burst shooting capabilities. 10 versus 8, and that's also dependent on us shooting in compressed RAW. Now I have no qualms with compressed RAW, but if you do, that's just something to keep in mind. Now, you're not really buying either of these cameras for that frame-specific fast action shots. There's the A9 and the A1 for that. It's not a high-speed action camera, you know? This is just for like that split-second moment to get a really nice high-resolution shot. Seven step in body image stabilization. The in body image stabilization have greatly improved from five axis and five step to five axis and seven step. What does that even mean? Well, as photographers, we can dip our shutter down into a whole few seconds, allowing in for more light and still get some stable, sharp shots, especially in low light situations. Now that's just insane. And I enjoy this improvement quite a lot as it frees me from having to bring a tripod in most situations and still pull off a decent long exposure shot. I fucking hate bringing tripods. We can bleep that. Now as video shooters, our handheld shots are gonna look that much steadier in active mode. But of course, we gotta talk about rolling shutter. Rolling shutter. <laughs> With the A7C Mark II, unfortunately with 4K full frame, the rolling shutter is pretty wavy. It's much better handled in APS-C mode. With the A7C R, it's actually the reverse. 4K full frame isn't too bad, but in uh, APS-C mode, that's looking wavy. Unless you're someone who frequently does torso twists while filming, then it's not something that you have to worry about. But it's always good to keep that in mind in case you're someone who likes to do sudden whip pants in your videos. Speaking of video, there's been a ton of improvements over the original A7C. Video. We're about to get the gimbal ready, slap on the 16 to 35 G Master 2, and we're gonna see what we can get. Let's see here, we got 4K. Wait for it, wait for it. Up to 60 frames per second. Yes! Finally! Yes! 4K 60 yes! frames per second! 4K 60 <laughs> frames per second! Hold your damn horses, all right? We got an asterisk right there, okay? Don't forget that. There's some caveat to this that I need to unleash on. Calm down. Jeez. 4K 60 frames per second. But uh, we might as well finish off this list right here just to get a few tidbits out of the way first. Uh, no 4K 120p. I wasn't expecting it, but it's hard to ignore considering the $1,400 APS-C A6700 that just came out can do 4K 120p. Damn. 1080p, still 120 frames per second, no 240 here either. But, but, we do have some awesome codecs and some fun vid rates. No, no, no sarcasm here. These are actually really nice. We now have the H.265 codec for that same crispy high quality videos, but at a lower file size. And we can push it further to 600 megabits per second all intro recording with the SI codec. We got options for 10-bit 422, really nice. Love seeing this as a standard, especially helpful if you plan on color grading a lot with S-Log footage. Now, speaking of slog, for popular picture profiles, we have S-Log 3. Walking down that aisle, ooh, strutting that stuff. Very beautiful, very beautiful. Hybrid log gamma. Not many people are using it nowadays, but hey, I mean, it's there if you want that high quality HDR look. And finally, the illustrious S-Cinetone. 
Though, I will say the most exciting thing about these new A7C cameras is the better S-Log3 workflow that has been introduced in the FX series. We have user assignable LUTs. We can display those LUTs on our cameras to preview and the options to bake in these LUTs while filming. That's LUTs. This is gonna help a lot of people to easily maximize the dynamic range of these cameras. They just make it too damn easy now. Like, you're an epic filmmaker now, you're an epic filmmaker now, and you are an epic filmmaker now. And if you wanna push it even further, only the A7CR has the HDMI capabilities for 16-bit raw output. Huh, not the A7C Mark II, unfortunately. Weird, but okay. Both cameras base ISO and S-Log3 starts at 800, and both seem to have an unofficial second base ISO, kicking it at 3200. As you can see here, the A7C R from 2500 to 3200, the noise cleans up significantly. Low light. For my video shooters, with no picture profile, the A7C Mark II can go up to 51,200 and 102,400 in the expanded ISO range, while the A7C R can only go up to 32,000. Keeping that knowledge in mind, putting them side by side, as we run up the ISO, the A7C Mark II holds the colors and minimizes noise better than the A7C R. Higher megapixel cameras tend to do worse at higher ISO ranges. Now, one thing you will notice is that the A7C Mark II does appear sharper on the left compared to the A7C R, and that's because the A7C Mark II is a 7K oversample, whereas the A7C R is just pure 4K in full frame mode. Don't worry, I'll explain more of that later. In my opinion, the A7C Mark II, I would say the acceptable ISO range to push up to, would be around 12,800. Around there, the A7C Mark II still maintains a decent amount of color and sharpness. For the A7C R, I would say keep it no more than 6400, just to be on the safe side. Now, noise level is fairly subjective, so I would highly recommend testing this out for yourself when you get your own copy of either of these cameras. For both cameras, if you really want to push it in low light, consider filming an S-Log3 to maximize your dynamic range. Recording tests and overheating? While I can attest to using them more in humid climates, both cameras held up well in 90 degrees Fahrenheit weather in sunny Los Angeles. 90 degrees Fahrenheit is something Celsius. And this is doing a mixture of photography and 4K videos all day. And no heat warning popped up for us. Running our recording test in a controlled environment, we're getting nearly identical run times on both cameras, with no heat warning popping up in either scenarios. For 4K 24p 10-bit 422 in the HS codec, we got a quarter and a third over two hours. Probably would have been able to max out the 128GB cards if the batteries didn't juice out first. For 4K 24p 10-bit 422 in the higher SI codec, we max out the cards, an hour and eight minutes. In the same vein, 4K 60p 10-bit 422 in the SI codec, we max out the cards, 27 and a half minutes. And finally, 4K 60p 10-bit 422 in the HS codec, we max out the cards at an hour and 16 minutes. Now, these are excellent numbers, but again, your environment and time of year will give you varying results. The 4K 60p conundrum. <sighs> 4K 60p. All right, class, turn your page, open up the asterisk note. Let's talk about it right now. We'll start off with the quality of the 4K shooting at good old 24 frames first. Like the A7 IV, the A7C Mark II is 7K oversampling in full frame mode, which means you get sharper 4K videos because it's technically shooting in 7K, but it's jammed up in a 4K box. However, the A7C R is not like that. You're just getting pure 4K in full frame mode. But in APS-C mode, you're getting 6.2K oversampling. Same concept, it's shooting 6.2K, but it's jammed up in a 4K box. In the grand scheme of things, 4K looking like 4K is just fine. I just want to point out the technicalities. But my issue here is the different crop factors when you're filming in 4K 60. It gets confusing here, so bear with me. Now, I can't say I'm surprised by the crop factor because these two cameras here are modeled off their bigger A7 counterparts. Like the A7 IV, the A7C Mark II can shoot up to 4K 60p, but only in APS-C Super 35 mode, which is a 1.5 times crop. Like the A7R5, the A7C R can shoot 4K 60p in full frame mode, but with a 1.2 times crop. Now, 1.2 is less than 1.5, 
but it's still a noticeable crop. And you cannot utilize 4K 60p in a PSC mode with the A7CR. Okay, glasses is coming off because it's serious. Let's break it down one by one. Starting off with the A7C Mark II. Let's say, for example, I'm using a 24 to 70 f2.8 full frame lens. I'm filming in 4K 24 in full frame mode, having a good time, and now I want to switch to 4K 60p for some epic slow motion videos. And. Oh. My field of view is now tighter. <laughs> this just became a 35 to 105 millimeter lens. Huh? Now, I would argue slow motion looks amazing with a tighter framing, but it's the tighter wide end that makes it frustrating. Sony just released the 16 to 35 G Master 2, which we have been testing in conjunction to this review. Now, imagine this. Imagine you can't even shoot 4K 60p at 16 millimeter because of the forced crop factor. It's now 24 millimeter on the widest end. In my review of the A7 IV, I have never agreed with this crop. I was told it was a technical limitation, but we bought a full frame camera, so it doesn't make any sense to me that we can't even shoot 4K 60p in full frame mode. So after I made my setup guide for this camera, I stopped using it for almost a year. But I decided to pick it up again earlier this year because ironically, it actually makes a great APS-C camera. We've used the Sigma 18 to 50 millimeter with it, which is an APS-C lens, and it's great. Flip flop back and forth, 4K 24 and 4K 60p. It's consistent. The framing is consistent. And if we want to have a wider view, we would just need to use an ultra wide angle APS-C lens. Now that's the great thing about using APS-C lenses on full frame bodies when shooting in 4K. There is no quality loss. And this same concept of using APS-C lenses could have been applied to the A7C Mark II, and this would have been a great APS-C video camera as well. But now, as of late 2023, it can't even be a best APS-C video camera anymore because a proper APS-C camera actually came out. The Sony A6700, which also gets you 4K 120 frames per second for 1400 buckaroos. So it's a huge letdown in my opinion not to be able to film 4K 60p with its full frame sensor. It is a little disappointing. Moving on to the A7CR. So for 4K 60, it does have a 1.2 times crop for technical reasons. It's noticeable, but it's not a huge penalty like the 1.5 times crop. And I can forgive that, but you can't shoot 4K 60p in a PSC mode. I know, I just spent the last few minutes complaining about the A7C2 and 4K 60p forcing us into APS-C mode, so why the hell would I even want that as an option for the A7CR? Hear me out here, okay? First off, let me clarify, it's not a big deal that it does not have 4K 60 in APS-C mode. But what I've always enjoyed about the A7R series is that flexibility of bouncing back and forth between full frame and APS-C freely. I'm a hybrid shooter who often uses APS-C on full frame bodies. So I'm also hybrid in that sense because I get those generous 20-ish megapixels for photos and I can keep the same lens on to shoot 4K 60p videos. So do you see why I said my brain hurts at the beginning? It's these odd technical limitations when it comes to wanting to shoot 4K 60p. And for this reason alone is why I don't love the A7C series. I just really, really, really like it. I love the full frame compact look. I love the seven step IBIS. I love the electronic viewfinder. I love the new updated menu. I love the extra custom buttons, the AI autofocus, the new codec, the new bitrate, the S tone, and all that good jazz. It's just a 4K 60p, man. That 4K 60p, it was just so damn close. So for now, I will stick to my Sony ZV-E1. Price and what Jason recommended. Now, I do love the direction Sony is heading in. The main A7 series cameras have gotten amazingly better over the years. However, I'm not a fan of them getting bigger and bigger. Sure, the dual SD card slot is nice, there's better heat dissipation, and there's more meat to hold. 
but I've switched from DSLRs to mirrorless cameras because they're smaller and lighter with top-notch hybrid features. So I'm really happy Sony is bringing back the compactness, what mirrorless cameras are supposed to be, in the form of the A7C. C stands for compact. And I'm really happy to see they're expanding to the R series, giving us a compact high-res beast. Ah, you see what I did there? C, R, ha, <laughs> Here's to hoping one day we'll see an A7CS and even an A1C. But for now, which of these two would I recommend? Again, if we're talking about photos, 33 megapixels on the A7C Mark II is going to be enough for most folks. It's actually quite a lot. You're not missing out much by buying a camera with half the megapixels. But if you are a megapixel fiend and you have the budget for it, the A7CR is the best compact iteration of the A7R5. As we discussed throughout this entire video, you're getting the best tech from either of these cameras and I would highly recommend getting them over the original A7C and the A7 III today. But if you find the video features a little lacking on both of these cameras like I do, I don't know, maybe your percentage is actually 30% photo and 70% video, then look into the Sony ZV-E1 for the best full frame video experience for roughly the same size and similar price. No crop 4K 60, 4K 120 is now available, amazing low light sensor, ah, in a compact small body. The only caveat is the lack of a viewfinder and no mechanical shutter. Or get the Sony a6700 for the best hybrid 50-50 photo video camera at a much lower cost. Only caveat is the smaller APS-C sensor. Both in-depth reviews of these cameras are linked in the description box below, but we'll have a more dedicated Sony camera buying guide in the future. So subscribe and stay tuned. Super T Hanks for watching. Now use my code Jason Vong to save 10% off your next Squarespace website or domain. Here's a word from our lovely Les Sponsor. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform to create beautiful websites. You don't need any coding knowledge whatsoever. Simply just choose from their many easy to use templates. Perfect for people like us who want to focus on our travels and make YouTube videos for you guys, but still want a presentable website for brands that are looking to work with us. Whether you're building your own photography portfolio, an e-commerce store, or even a landing page for your business, design it with Squarespace. Get a 14-day trial with my link below and try it for yourself. When you're ready to launch, you can save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain with my code Jason Vaughn. Guys, thank you so much for watching and we'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace. Oh, pretty flipping amazing. I really like it.